and what he knows. He is incredibly smart, and I love that he is okay to help other people with that knowledge that he knows. So I just want to welcome him here. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Hamilton, again, and she's been really cooperative in getting this whole thing organized. So, once again, Mary, thank you. How's everyone this morning? Great. I do encourage an open forum. This is, rather than me talking to you, I prefer talking with you. And the, uh, that forum allows me to address any questions that I can uh, perceive that you have. So, I encourage you once again to stop and ask questions if they arise. There's going to be a lot of information. I have a tendency sometimes to skip over the water, so to speak, when I talk science, so I want you to calm me down a little bit if that's what happens. In other words, ask for clarification, and it's not going to be interrupting uh, the pace of what we're talking about, so to speak. So once again, I do encourage you feeling comfortable to ask questions, okay? Is everyone all right with that? Okay. So basically what I'm going to start with is what initiated, initiated me into uh, finding alternative health care was the fact that I myself was diagnosed with diabetes when I was 17 years old. Now many of you know that diabetes is an ongoing, it's a pandemic at this point. Uh, in 1972, to give you an idea, one in 72 Americans were diagnosed with some form of diabetes, type 1 or type 2. In next year, that number will be one in three. So you can see 40 some odd years what has happened and when we're talking about something like diabetes and what, what has created diabetes, encourage me to look beyond what allopathic medicine or modern medicine is finding. Obviously, we don't see a lot of, sorry, we don't see a lot of benefits currently right now because we see the, the current increase in diabetes, and that makes us uh, look at the fact that we're not able to find, or currently we're not able to find something substantial as far as the cause of the factors. So once again, when I was diagnosed with diabetes, that encouraged me to go on another route, which is where I am today, and that is biochemistry. So biochemistry is my background. I approach pathologies from a biochemical point of view, and that's why we've had relatively good success in my clinic. So what I'm going to do here is the first subject I'm going to start with is basically pathologies and why we are seeing, we're looking at them in a different direction. In other words, people have a tendency to think linear rather than dimensionally, and I encourage people to think dimensionally rather than in flat planes, so to speak, when we're talking about diseases. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If we look at diabetes, and we're going to start with this, number one, what do you think is the primary cause for diabetes? Everyone has a general idea. Does anyone have any idea of what might be one of the premier causes for diabetes? Diet. Um, yeah, and pancreas? So? Correct. But that is, that is the most common recognition is the diet has been one of the foremost changes that we've seen recently in 40 years or even uh, less with why we see an accumulation or a, uh, a greater condition of diabetes that we see in, in situations in America at least. With diabetes, pancreas is one of the primary problems. Now, some of you probably have relatives or friends or spouses that have had been diagnosed with maybe pre-diabetic conditions or uh, diabetes itself. Diabetes is relatively easy to take care of. And we're saturated with uh, an inordinate amount of media propagation that says, well, diabetes used to be a metformin, so on and so forth, to control conditions of blood sugar. We look at diet and why, and, and I want to elaborate this. When we look at nature, if you go out into the desert as an example and you look at animals, we have not recognized any form of diabetes in nature, only through domestication and only through humans. It's just like obesity. 
if we look at nature, take a drive out into this desert, see if you can find any animal, bird, aquatic, that is obese. It's only humans or what humans influence, such as domesticated animals. So getting back to diabetes, diabetes is an acquired condition. Does that make sense? Acquired means we can address it. If it's acquired, we can essentially change that condition. And it's relatively easy, folks. We're doing it all the time. As a matter of fact, I've been working in research on type 1 diabetes, and we've found some phenomenal responses on how people are responding on activating the uh, beta cells. Beta cells are what secrete in the pancreas insulin. We're finding ways of managing that successfully to reactivate the beta cells, something that Western medicine isn't aware of right now. Right now. In probably five years, but right now, we're getting substantial responses on activating the cells, which brings a dynamic case up. If we're able to do this, what else are we able to do? Genetics is an example. And I want to get into this. Telomeres. Telomeres are end caps. Has anyone heard of telomeres? In genetics, you have chromosomes, basically, and these telomeres are end caps on the chromosomes. Does everyone basically understand what a chromosome is? Chromosome DNA, so on and so forth. The package of DNA. Well, something that's interesting is there's something, there's something called a Hayflick limit. And the Hayflick limit determines how many times your cells divide. Okay? So basically, humans have a division rate of 49, which means your cells divide 49 times during your lifespan. There's no way of increasing this number. Currently, we have no way of increasing this. After 49 divisions, folks, your cells go through apoptosis. They begin to die. This is aging. Okay? This is important to understand. So basically, when your cell divides, there's no reversal. If it's divided 20 times, you have 29 times left, and that's it. There's no way of changing that. However, yes? What causes them to divide? What? Very good. That's a very good question. There's a time clock. And telomeres are the genetic time clock right here. They sit on the end of chromosomes, OK? And this is important to understand. So for this young lady, to answer this young lady's question, a telomere are the genetic time clocks, or the little clock that's ticking in your cell. Now, since we can't change the division rates, 49 is set. That's it. What we can do, consequently, to change aging is what? If that telomere divides, or the, the time clock is telling us when the cell divides, what can we do? We can begin to influence these telomeres. Now, the reason I'm going down this road here is the fact that telomeres are influenced. They can, they can break down or fragment rapidly. Does anyone know, have, has anyone heard of Hutchinson's Guilford syndrome? <coughs> Hutchinson's Guilford syndrome is where you see kids that are 13 that look like they're 90. You ever seen that? This is how we found out about telomeres and what consequently the aging. Well, in Hutchinson's Guilford syndrome, these telomeres fragment rapidly beyond what the average individual, as an example, sitting in this room, experience. These telomeres fragment rapidly. There's no controlling. The genetic time clock is saying divide, divide, divide. And 49 division rates is, a, is approaching very quickly. And then they die at about 13 or 14 years old. What influences these telomeres are something called peroxides. Peroxides are 
ox oxygen molecules. Now, oxygen is important for us, right? We rely on it for life. But it's also one of the most damaging things we can experience. And the reason why is these peroxides are unstable. We recognize it as nascent oxygen. Or when you look at the periodic table, you look at oxygen itself, that's the form it's in. It's not paired. Many of you are familiar with O2, which is paired. It has two oxygen molecules. When there's a single oxygen molecule, it pairs. It's a radical, so to speak. You've heard of radicals, or oxidation, and so on and so forth, and reduction, and you've heard about that whole process. Well, in this situation, these attack the telomere. The telomere begins to fragment rapidly. Now, I've talked to other geneticists who say, well, why don't we influence telomerase, which is the enzyme that basically influences these telomeres. Telomerase, if you influence telomerase, tel guess if there is a, uh, a response, a disease that we see that is rich in telomerase, and that's cancer cells. So consequently, the mistake that geneticists are going down is increasing the activity of telomerase, and we don't want to do that because that's encouraging propagation of neoplasms. Does that make sense? By slowing down this, the fragmentation of these telomeres, by squelching this, okay, we're able to preserve this and preserve it beyond what is recognized today, folks, and we're doing it right now. Instead of the aging path that we're seeing today, which is an average of 1.4 years with every cell division in humans, we're able to get that to two years. Why? And it doesn't sound like it's, I know it doesn't sound dramatic. If it was say 500 years, 1,000 years. There's a preposition that we can get humans to live to 135 years in quality life, not quality life. And we do, yeah, I know, I'm sorry. He's going, yeah, I've heard this before. Okay. So, how do we do this? We preserve this. So the oxygen or the peroxides do not damage the telomeres. It's that simple, folks. When you go outside into the city, there are several things or into the environment. The environment today is not what it was 100 years ago. We have to understand that, right? Carbon monoxide, acrylamides, ethoxyquins. I could just go on and on and on that essentially create these. Okay? You don't have to even eat these. You can just go out and through respiratory response, you take them in internally. Does that make sense? If you had the cleanest diet in the world, unfortunately, we're in a situation in a modern environment where we have conditions of carbon monoxide levels that are so high that basically they create more fragmentation of this. When we have that, we have a situation where we're not increasing in age, folks. You hear in news that uh, we're living longer. No. What is happening is infant mortality is dropping, which is, which is skewing the information. Really, humans are only living about two years longer than they did 100 years ago. Right now, we're in a situation to where we have more compounds that are creating fragmentation on these telomeres. We have a way of preserving that. And basically, by squelching these peroxides, we're able to preserve the telomere. And we do, we do this through something called GSHP. This is important, folks. Keep this in mind. You're going to be hearing a lot about this in the future on news. And you may want to Google. I've written several articles on this, and the articles you might find interesting. I think you'll be able to find them. If you Google my name, you'll find the articles I've written on telomeres. GSHP is glutathione peroxidase. It's, it's an enzyme. There are five of these families. And these enzymes, this enzyme activity is extremely important for being able to squelch the peroxides. This is a huge key, folks, right here. And as I mentioned before, you're going to hear more and more about this in the future. Can you spell it out? Glutathione peroxidase, sure. Peroxidase. And just for your 
interest, anytime you hear an ACE as a suffix, that's an enzyme. Okay? There's so many different enzymes. There's reductases, oxidases. Uh, so just to give you an idea, any, yes? So Kevin, like, you hear a lot about antioxidants. So I guess uh, from what I understand, what you've heard you say, well, glutathione is like a master antioxidant for your body. Is that right? Exactly. You hear, now folks, this is important. And what I'm here to do is, is dispel some fallacies you hear about with uh, supplements and things like that because I don't want you throwing money away when you don't need to. There's a supplement out here, as Ian suggested, it's called glutathione, okay? And basically, glutathione, don't take glutathione because you're just wasting your money. What we want to do is we want to get the body to produce glutathione peroxidase, its activity by itself. Remember, people try to override the body. That's not how we, that's not how we look at designing things. As an example, a lot of you have heard about growth hormone. When you put a hormone, if it's going to be an anabolic steroid like testosterone, you're overriding the system. Your system is not controlling it. It is important to remember, calculate the body as 50% and then add 50%, and then that leads to the equation of 100%. Modern pharmaceuticals do not do that. They calculate, I know, because I used to help design for some of these things. Basically, what modern pharmaceuticals are doing is they're overriding the system. They're 75% to 100%. They're not calculating the human body. Does that make sense? That's why we have problems today with these prescription drugs. How many people in this room have seen those commercials where it just goes on? And more than half the commercials telling you what's going to happen to your mother-in-law when you take this stuff. She's going to end up dying. It's that dangerous. Does that make sense? I'm not saying that mother-in-law's bad. <laughs> the point is, is to understand that override, we never want to override the body. We want to hit 50 and 50. So, <clears throat> in relationship to Ian's question, glutathione is overriding the system. It is saying we've got a preformed, it's a tripeptide basically, there's three amino groups that are put together. What it means basically is that they're suggesting you can take glutathione and it'll form or activate glutathione peroxidase. No, it will not. Basically it will break down. And let me put it this way, if you take a cake you bake the cake and it's finished baking. Take it out of the oven. And then you take it and put water in it again. Just mix it all together and put it back in the oven. What are you going to add? That's right. You add the ingredients and let the body do the rest. Remember, the body is this right here. The same conditions we have with uh, inoculations. Inoculation, folks. There's no proof that inoculations don't work, but there's no proof that they do work either. Okay, and I can get on to that in a different subject or a different time. Well, let's get back to the telomeres. So GSHP is how we control these. Now, <coughs> there's a difference between radicals and oxidants. Okay, a radical is any compound or any atom that's unpaired and could start bouncing around like a, a pinball machine that's out of control. So there's a difference with that. A lot of people group those together, and it's not antioxidants or oxidants, oxidation, different than radicals. Radicals could be a lot of things. A radical could be an isotope, radioactive isotope. So getting back to this, increasing GSHP, the family, we're increasing the enzymes, which means that we have the greatest opportunity of preserving these telomeres. And we're seeing it happen, folks, right now. This is the exciting part. We're actually seeing telomer preservation, so to speak. Okay? Now, we can't elongate the telomer. We can't bring it back to what it was, but we can preserve it so the cell division occurs much slower. As it occurs much slower, we have a greater quality of life because, folks, this is related to a lot of pathologies we see today. Right here, these telomeres. Now, when we talk about radiation exposure, everyone knows what radiation is, right? Basically, radiation is what denatures. Everyone remember what DNA is? Remember the helix, the double helix? Remember that? 
and they're held together with nucleotides. Remember that little? <laughs> but basically what happens is radiation, I'm going to explain, it's a little more complex than this, but for the sake of this lecture, in a simplistic form, what radiation does is it breaks this down. It fragments. It's, in some cases, situations, it's called depurination. Depurination occurs in part because this, the exposure of this, there's a combination of several factors, but this is one. There is a way to anneal DNA. And DNA wants to heal, folks. When it's exposed to radiation, there's three, uh, there's three destinations for a cell. One is apoptosis, which is death. The other is annealing. And annealing, folks, in genetics means the DNA comes together again. It wants to heal, wants to correct itself. That's what, that's what DNA wants to do. It's more probable that that will happen if the conditions are correct. The third destiny is mutation. And everyone knows what mutation. Sometimes mutation can be favorable. Sometimes. Other times, obviously, in today's world, we see a lot of things like cancers, neoplasm, so on and so forth. So getting back to this, this contributes to protecting the DNA. Let me give you an example. When you're in the sun, you've heard about sunscreens and sunblocks and everything else, which, by the way, don't work. Okay? And the reason they don't work, and I'm just going to tie this back together, sunblocks and sunscreens just prevent burning. They don't prevent exposure to radiation. They don't, they don't prevent the, the denaturing of DNA. I want you folks to understand this. Go to the Wikipedia if you want, look at sunblock controversy, uh, and a lot of researchers, correctly so, have recognized that sunblocks and sunscreens don't work. All they do is prevent burning, which essentially, when you burn, that protects you tells you you've been out in the sun long enough, and the erythemia essentially leads to a corrective mechanism to repair itself. We're preventing that, folks. We're seeing an increase in skin cancer, not a decrease. You notice that? If sunblocks worked, if sunscreen worked, we'd see a, an extinction, so to speak, of skin cancer, or near extinction, if they said it did what it did. So I just want you to understand, folks, the sunblock and sunscreen is fooling you and the thing is predicting DNA. So getting back to this, how are we going to do this? How are we going to increase glutathione peroxidase or the enzyme, the activity of glutathione peroxidase? We have several things that we're finding out that are effective for this. And two of them are sulfur branched amino acids. These two sulfur branched amino acids, as a matter of fact, I applied for a patent on this process. And getting through the examiner, if any of you have dealt with the examiner's office in Washington, D.C., it gets to be elongated, so to speak. But anyway, how we're able to increase this is increasing the sulfur component, which influences glutathione peroxidase and increasing something called selenium. Everyone have heard of, has heard of selenium. It's a transitional element. And a transitional ele element literally means an element that acts like a vitamin. Okay, that's what it, when you hear transitional element, it works like a vitamin. Zinc, copper, so on and so forth. Basically what we're doing is we're able to increase glutathione peroxidase activity by increasing the sulfur component within the system. When you heard your mother tell you to eat your broccoli and Brussels sprouts, that was actually a very good thing because the cruciferous vegetables are high in sulfur. That's why they have that pungent smell. Onions is an example, so on and so forth. So it brings us back to diet and why diet is important. Or should I say meal plan eating, so to speak. We're looking at several factors here. Number one is why has why in today's society, as I mentioned previous, diabetes is incurred at such a rapid rate. Number one, cancer is not diminishing, right? We can go through this. Folks, we're not seeing really any diminishment in 
diseases. As a matter of fact, we're seeing conditions come up that haven't been rise in quite a while. Pellagra, bearberry, things like that, because people are avoiding wheat now, the big fad. Okay, I'll get into that. Yes? How does, what does stress do physiologically to the glutathione? Problem? Emotional or? Anyone you want to do, and, and if it's not in the right time when you want to talk about it. Like wait, stress, that's okay. I yeah. was just wondering what it physiologically is doing, whether it's. Okay, if we're talking about, very good question, if we're talking about emotional stress, emotional stress increases adrenaline. You know, when all you folks are sitting there trying to get your homework done or whatever, same thing, adrenaline. Adrenaline consequently increases glucose from the cells, it spikes glucose leading to hyperglycemia. Glucose levels, when they spike up and down quite a bit, begin to form several different compounds that are, because what happens is it throws the body off. You know, sorbitol is one of them. Sorbitol levels increase. That's what creates uh, retinal damage in diabetics. It's a sorbitol level. And sorbitol is an alcohol sugar. So to answer your question, emotional stress can begin to to comp or compromise this due to the fact that we see these fluctuations in sugar stress. Not only that, we see a condition where the parietal cells, which line the stomach, folks, <coughs> and I get into this whole different <coughs> in this whole different thing here about parietal cells and stress. Stress is doing a lot of things, emotional stress is doing a lot of things to us. Parietal cells are instrumental, and I'll get into this in just a little bit. They consequently inhibit our ability to absorb nutrients like we used to. How many times do we sit at a dinner table or a breakfast table and we're completely relaxed? And we're just eating in nirvana? Or how many times are we thinking about the IRS, the bills we owe, the mortgage? See what I'm saying? Stress, to answer your question, we've seen remarkable increases in stress on everyday life and families around America, not just America, but the world. So this is how it can influence the telomeres. Environmental stress, as I mentioned before, is even more prominent when we're talking about carbon monoxide and things like that. In a situation like this, we have to counterbalance. So sure, we can have this situation. A lot of people say, why do we have to keep taking supplements? It's not a natural thing. No longer is this natural outside. We have to establish a balance to reach equilibrium. Therefore, we can do this in a situation where we're talking about meal, diet, the way we eat, or supplementation, if we do the correct supplementation. A lot of people are told through the media, the media with supplementation is just as bad as pharmaceutical advertising, folks. If you're talking about uh, new skin or anything else, that's just a big joke as pharmaceuticals are. Now, it's important to understand that pharmaceuticals do have their place if they're used correctly. We have to understand the limitations of them. You can use an antibiotic for a specific period of time, but unfortunately, many doctors don't understand limits. Does that make sense? It's like asking a baby to drive a car. So it's unfair for us to ask a physician to correctly advise us on it to do things correctly because they themselves don't know. How many times have you been in a dermatologist and they come in to help you and they have acne? And that makes you question. Or your cardiologist comes in and he weighs 350 pounds. What encourages you to believe the doctor? Does that make sense? The track record, folks, is not too favorable for the AMA at this point. I'm not saying all of it. It's very effective in many cases if you're in an auto accident, surgeries, but we have to recognize common sense and we have to recognize uh, a point in time where limitations have to be understood. I have my limitations. The doctors have their limitations. A roofer that's doing your house has its limitations. You're not going to ask a roofer to fix your car, I hope. You know, that's the point. So sometimes we're misdirected and it's not the physician's fault because they don't understand themselves. Does that make sense? They think they understand. And so the blame really can't be, I mean it can to some degree, but it can't in other ways because 
they themselves are misled, if that makes sense. So to answer your question, environmental toxins, emotional toxins, that's how emotional toxins will essentially affect it. Now, getting back to stress, folks, very important. don't want to deal with digesting food at this time. We want to deal with fleeing or doing what we need to do in stressful conditions. Right now, we're always, a lot of us are generally in a fright flight scenario. We're stressed. If we're not thinking about the IRS, or we talked about this before. So what happens is these cells are compromised. They begin to shut down. Hydrochloric acid is lessened in its secretion. Hydrochloric acid is responsible for breaking down proteins, to some degree carbohydrates and fats. So can you imagine what happens <coughs> in a continual state of stress in your eating? <coughs> what happens to the food that you're eating? Since in here it's not completely broken down, it goes into the alimentary canal, the digestive system. You're not even getting the full, probably half of the nutrient content of your food. What's more important is this nutrient is, remains in very high molecular bond structures. The body's not used to this, and it creates conditions further down. They can elaborate situations like autoimmune conditions. Can anyone name what an autoimmune condition is? Lupus, arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, allergies. So what happens is we're finding out that this is a key factor. And if you want to know, it's called hypochlorhydria. Chlorhydria. Okay? And hypochlorhydria exists in what is estimated to be 90% of the adult population. The food you're eating, or what you're taking in, you may be getting only 50% extraction of the nutrients, but even what's more dramatic is you're now creating compounds in your system that the antibodies are becoming aware of. If an antibody, if a compound gets into the lower alimentary canal that resembles the high protein sugar that resembles cartilage, guess what's going to happen? The antibody is going to begin to signal and recognize that your own cartilage is a foreign invader, just like the undigested food is. So the antibodies begin to signal responses, and it begins to attack your own cartilage. In lupus, it begins to attack the skin. Does that make sense? Ulcers are created because not having high amounts of activity, which means the stomach acid is extremely low. If we look at the pH of the stomach acid, it should be 1. Now, that's extremely, that's a high amount of hydrogen protons. It's a lot of energy, so it takes a lot of energy from our body to keep that pH that low. When that doesn't happen, the sterile environment of the stomach is lost. And several factors can begin to 
uh, reside, such as H. pylori. Has anyone heard of H. Heliobacter pylori? Or Heliobacter pylori? It's a bacteria that can propagate to a point where it begins to erode the mucosal lining. And when it erodes the mucosal lining, you have an ulcer. That makes sense? And, and is that similar to what the candida is? I have a friend who's got the, um, the excessive candida. Um, she says nobody knows how to doctor this, and so she's sick with her stomach and inflammation in it. Right. Maybe it isn't that, though. Maybe no, but that's a good question. Candida or candidiasis, there's two different types exist naturally in your body. It's what happens is, now remember, it's there normally in your lower intestinal tract. But what happens in her conditions where the probiotic response is lost, candida albicans will propagate. It will become systemic. It can enter the bloodstream. We recognize it as thrush, oral thrush. And what it can do is it can lead to fatigue. It can lead to a lot of manifestations like skin problems because what happens is the yeast, remember it's a, it requires a host, folks. Yeast, molds, viruses, those all require hosts. Their DNA require a host scenario. So to answer your question, the yeast requires fuel, which is in the form of sugar, and it produces uh, exotoxins like carbon dioxide, just like when you're making a loaf of bread, as an example. So it's different than the bacteria. The bacteria is different in its DNA structure. To answer your question, the yeast is more like it is just that yeast, and it propagates, and it can become systemic and lead to fatigue and other uh, symptoms that we see, such as skin manifestations, so on and so forth. And the best way of taking candida or to addressing candida is to lower the amount of sugar that's consumed, number one, and to take things that are anti-yeast, things such as garlic, alicin, which is the favorable component in garlic, is very effective for taking care of yeast. And there's specific oils, believe it or not, like oregano and thyme, are extremely effective in eradicating yeast. We also have something called unicinellic acid, and that's taken from castor beans is extremely effective for taking care of yeast. Yeast is relatively, or candida, is relatively easy to take care of. That is. So is pylori. The bacteria is extremely easy to take care of. The premise of this little conversation, though, is to talk about how do we get the parietal cells to work as they should? How do we get them up to activity? And we can do that by simply administering something called trimethylated glycine or betine. So if any of you are ever interested in testing where your cells are, you can pick up betine, which is basically taken from sugar beets. And what that does is that activates, and just test yourself. Take two pills with every meal and see how it feels. If you feel a slight warm sensation in the sternum, that indicates that the parietal cells are active. Probably not going to happen, folks. Most people, as I mentioned before, about 90% is estimated, have low parietal cell activity. Now, these can be associated with skin problems. The great eczema, psoriasis, dermatitis, skin pro acne can generally be addressed by addressing those parietal cells bringing them up to activity. So you have long-term, people that have long-term situations of eczema, and so on and so forth, the test will probably suggest that they are low in activity in the parietal cells. It's that easy, folks. Ulcers, getting back to that, peptic ulcers, to eradicate the H. pylori, we do something as simple as bismuth. And bismuth can essentially be very effective at taking care of this and healing the ulcer. What I'm suggesting to you folks is this equation here, 50-50, not the prescriptions. A lot of doctors hit you with antibiotics. They don't need antibiotics to take care of pylori to take care of an ulcer. You don't need hydrocortisone cream to take care of dermatitis or psoriasis many times. Is that why I also suggest you don't drink 
water with your meals because it increases the pH of your, your that, that is correct. Of your so, he, he, yes, Ian's correct. Remember, folks, that's a tremendous amount of energy. A pH of one. Tremendous amount. Now, if, I'm sure people know pH means part hydrogen. Hydrogen ion. That's what it means. And it's a tremendous amount of energy to keep a pH so low like that. Now, consequently, people have heard about keeping your pH alkaline. Everyone's heard about that, haven't they? Keeping the pH alkaline and so on and so forth. This consequently keeps the pH alkaline. Incre decreasing the pH in the stomach creates more alkalinity in the serum. Serum should be about 7.4 to 7.38. That's a very narrow range. If we drop <laughs> below this, we begin to experience the cells. Remember we talked about apoptosis, cell death? We begin to experience cell death. If this environment continues, I'm talking about lower than 7.38. Now you have something that's a bicarbonate pool and a buffer, so at times you are going to drop that, but it's not going to be very long. If this continues, healthy cells aren't used to that environment. They're not. They begin to die. So the body and its protective mechanism begins to reestablish. Remember when we talked about DNA? It's going to create a mutation. It's trying to evolve to survive an acidic environment. So basically what you're seeing, cancer is evolution, folks. That's all it is. It's just our body is not evolved enough to host cancer. And it kills <coughs> us. If we understand this, we understand we haven't evolved to this degree to host cancer, then what we're going to do is we're going to bring that pH back up to 7.38 or 7.4. The cells die, they divide, and they're trying to survive. In a way, they don't know that they're bad. They're trying to keep this body living. So they mutate. And they form an erratic cell. It's a neoplasm. So basically, folks, cancer's trying to save you. I know it sounds bizarre. Cancer is telling you, listen, you're not doing this. The analogy is I can take a banana tree and plant it out here in the yard or outside, is that banana tree going to live? Yeah. But if I construct a dome over it and put a thermostat, will that banana tree live? Probably. It's the same analogy right here. If you don't allow the environment a chance for the evolution to occur, it won't occur. That's basically all cancer is, folks. That's what it is. And I can elaborate on the respiratory insult that occurs on the mitochondria if you want. We're doing, I'm doing a, a university trial on one of my products that shows this. It's called, if you want to look at it, it's called the Warburg Hypothesis. And right now, Montana State University is evaluating one of my patents on how this could very well help understand the influence of why this happens at the DNA. And it has to do with the respiratory insult. But can, it, cancer's that easy, folks, to understand. It's not, you know, it's not something that has to be dynamic that people don't understand the curative process. It's just a matter of keeping your system in a range that is favorable for healthy cells. See how easy that is? Yes? What do you mean by respiratory insight? Basically, the mitochondria requires a condition where there's a gradient. A this is where I might get a little, yeah. Yeah, excuse me here. Uh, the gradient means it, it correctly manages the cell. Every cell has a mitochondria or living cells within our cell except red blood cell levels. Most cells have this response and there's a respiratory response inside the cell that creates the correct mechanism. If that respiratory response doesn't occur, then you can have damage to the cell or damage to DNA. That's a very good question, though. Thank you. Do you have any questions so far? I don't have a question, but I wanted to know what is 
down on here said about the water with meals. Okay, what Ian meant was when you drink water, it dilutes the hydrochloric acid, which changes the pH. It elevates so not the pH. To drink water. That's not a good Correct, thing. with meals, because it dilutes the possibility or the probability of being able to break the foods down correctly. Water, folks, can kill you. For some reason, in this country, you're told to drink when you're not thirsty. I try to get my dog to drink when he's not thirsty. He looks at me like an idiot, and I am. I'm trying to get him to go ahead. Try that with your horses. Yeah. Drink. You know, look at you like, what are you doing? Humans are the only ones that have to be taught to drink when they're not thirsty. This is ridiculous. Let's not lose our natural, uh, you know, it has to do with the hypothalamus and stuff, so <coughs> our natural requirements to know when we're thirsty. Drink when you're thirsty. <coughs> People are drinking so much you're told to drink eight ounces. Guess what this does? It diminishes the pH. Because when you drink more water, what do you lose? Potassium, sodium, magnesium, all those wonderful electrolytes that keep this at an optimal level. Yes, folks, drinking a lot of water could potentially cause cancer. Seriously. Because you're constantly going to be in an acidic state. So when you want to wash food down, what's safe to drink while you're eating the meat? No, it's okay. When you're thirsty or there's a demand, then drink. But is there something that will help the pH of your stomach that would be better to drink when you're eating? It bay time? This situation, if you're going to drink, can uh, potentially help that situation. It can basically assist that process. The important thing to understand is why drink when you're not thirsty? Why drink when you're not thirsty? Can you imagine all those islanders that are indigenous societies in the Amazon or the Islanders? You're not drinking? when you're, And they look at you like, what? And they're living just as long and healthy as anyone else. So obviously another fallacy, folks. A fallacy that's potentially dangerous by drinking when you're not thirsty. So I think the point that I was trying to make is that you can, that you, the water's important to, have, to keep hydrated, but not to have it when you're having your meal because you get a, it's going to, and a lot of you guys might understand the pH scale. You might want to just refresh sure. where water fits in the. Okay, in the thank you. Water basically, you know, it's recognized. Thank you so much. Are you thirsty, Winslow? Want to drink? I tried so that. basically, water is. Thank you. So basically, water is recognized as neutral, so to speak, H2O. So basically, what happens is when you drink water, it dissociates. Water, or hydration, in biochemistry, we don't recognize uh, you know, dehydration. We recognize dehydration as a loss of electrolytes. Because what water does, water is a universal solvent. And water is what helps get the electrolytes into the cell. So biochemically, water is not dehydrated. It's the electrolytes that we're missing, if that makes sense. So, I have my system here. Okay. So, to answer your question with water, when you're eating, if you shift, and this has to do with diet, the more vegetables we consume, the less water we're going to require to eat. Why? Because vegetables are full of water. And it's the purest water. It's the foods, such as high sugars, dried components, so on and so forth, that cause us to Number one, if it's excessive in one situation, like even sugar, if you notice when you eat a lot of sugar, you want to drink because your body naturally, and we see this in diabetics, is to get the sugar out of the system. That's why they drink so much. So to answer your question, folks, water, drink when you're thirsty. If you're not thirsty, why drink? Do you eat when you're not hungry? Well, in normal situations. <laughs> okay. Basically, that's something that I think that's important to keep in mind. Yes. So, I work with pregnant women a lot, and I'm counseling them that they need to drink, depending on their body weight, two to three quarts of water a day. My person. Pregnant women here show up in the ER if they're yes. in 
preterm labor, and then they're told you're dehydrated, they're given IVs. So I'm trying to do my job effectively. I understand. So what do I do? Well, the dehydration in that situation is due to different situations, like preeclampsia is an example. Preeclampsia occurs primarily right. because of the electrolyte shift. Preeclampsia, right. folks, do you folks know? Uh -huh. Go ahead. No, I just... Yeah, so to answer your question, <coughs> dehydration, there's a different mismanagement in that situation. The more they drink, remember the rule of thumb, urination, you shouldn't, people shouldn't urinate more than three or four times a day. Yeah, you can range a test, a measurement pH test, and you'll find that the potassium is lost after five or six times. That potassium is important, as you know the potassium, so I assume you're a nurse, right? No, I'm not a social worker. Okay, but potassium sodium is important. You can literally lose so much potassium, folks, that you'll begin to experience, you know what muscle tightness is? It's where you begin to feel twitches. That's the first sign that you're losing potassium. You've gone to a point of that it can be questionable. The next situation is going to be, it's going to begin to affect your nerves. The third, gets a little more severe. It affects the cardiac muscle. The Pagunji fibers. Remember Pagunji fibers? They're what gets the heart to do what it does. That's why the potassium sodium pump is so important. When we're talking about water, it throws the potassium sodium pump off. So when you look at potassium and sodium, right? What happens is it throws that off. The ratio of potassium sodium is one to five. And once you shift that in the cell, it changes. Our American diet is full of sodium. So, but there's a difference. We need sodium. Yeah. Sure. The idea that high blood pressure is associated with sodium, uh -uh. it's kidney problems. You have primary and secondary hypertension. Too many people in America are stopping sodium because they're told that it's dangerous. It is not dangerous, folks. You need sodium. You need potassium. Because it participates in this. So we have a situation now where this country is on a wrong track, if not the world. Australia as well, right, Ian? Same situation. People are being told, just like vitamin C, the fallacy of vitamin C. Vitamin C, folks, is a radical. And people are taking it in high amounts. And I challenge Linus Pauling's work. And sure enough, guess what he died of? Cardiovascular. It's like, whoa, why aren't these people? And folks, I'm not that smart. The world's just that stupid. OK, I mean, seriously, it's like, this is common sense. And we have people that are propagating things, such as vitamin C. Vitamin D is the big fad now. No, vitamin D. But when you get levels of vitamin D, say so your D3 is deficient, all it shows is metabolic process. It's how you're utilized. It doesn't mean you need it. It's sad. It's like cholesterol. Okay, you've got me started. Uh, Are we causing you stress? Actually, I have a lot of fun doing this. Uh, the parietal cells, or we, we talk about parietal cells and stress, but let me talk about cholesterol, folks. <laughs> I'm a renegade, if you can't already tell. So basically, but this is the beauty of biochemistry, is to tell you the truth, to tell you to separate fallacy from fact. When you go in, how many of you have had blood tests recently, and you're told your cholesterol is high, or it's good, or the doctor's saying, hey, this is, it. you're familiar with that, right? OK, I just want to make sure we address that. What they're reading, folks, is something called lipoproteins. OK? And you can have HDLs. Are you familiar with this? LDLs. I wrote an article about this and it was published. It. Did you see that article? Yeah. And fortunately, we see some you know, it was published, I think, in a magazine or something. But this is the biochemical fact, folks. This is not cholesterol. This basically is a sphere 
Think of a globe. It's made of fat and proteins. And it has attachment sites. This is an amphoteric response, meaning that it has polarity. Basically what this means is it attaches cholesterol to these sites. What they're reading, folks, is not cholesterol. They're reading the globes. Why you have a high density lipoprotein is because it sinks in an obvious solution. Why you have a low density lipoprotein is why they float. It's understood that these are bad. These aren't bad. It's just a different vehicle. It's a different type. Think of a school bus that takes children to school. Now, if I had you for a day stand out, what highway is it? What is, is this? I am. 80 or whatever? If I had you stand out there for a day and take count of how many cars went by in one day, and then at the end of the day you came back and I asked for a report, and you said, well, there are 7,000 cars. And I said, oh, good. That's 7,000 people. What'd you guys tell me? <laughs> no. By reading this, you can't tell what <laughs> cholesterol is. But they're telling you, your high density liberal proteins are good, your low density liberal proteins are bad, let's put you on a stat drug. Without a doubt, one of the most dangerous drugs ever designed. Guaranteed. You're going to be hearing about this one, too. What do they have, 120 lawsuits a month or something on these stat? Rightfully so. What statin drugs do, folks, is they shut off an enzyme called HMG in the intestinal tract that produces these vehicles. Now remember, cholesterol, folks, saves you. It is the primary component of cell membranes. It is the primary component of organs and tissue. So what they're doing, folks, is shutting that down. How do you feel about that? They're shutting the delivery, the vehicle that takes the school children to, to school. Is there a wonder why we're seeing the people having bad effects with statin drugs? This is another reason I, that product or that process I designed will replace statin drugs, hopefully, once we see the trials finish, which are about 10 weeks. But that's side point. What they're doing, these HMG drugs, are shutting down lipoproteins. And remember, folks, cholesterol repairs the body. Atherosclerosis is a situation where the arteries narrow, right? That is due, yes, to cholesterol repairing the damage. But is cholesterol the fault? What was damaging the arterial wall? That's the problem. If you keep damaging the arterial wall, cholesterol is just doing its job. It's repairing and repairing, so it saves your life. So what people aren't looking at, so what they're doing is they're giving you a stat drug to shut this down. So what happens when your arterial wall is injured again? Pretty frightening stuff, right? I mean, this is like a Stephen King novel, folks. Western medicine is literally, for the most part, pharmaceuticals, are just a horror story. What causes problems in the arterial wall are triglycerides, blood fats. So when you get a lipoprotein test or a lipid profile, the triglycerides are essentially what creates the damage to the arterial wall. All cholesterol is doing is trying to repair it. It's trying to save you. So thanks to statin drugs, they're shutting that mechanism down. Now statin drugs don't control or lower triglycerides, so you still have the same problem of high blood fats that are damaging the arterial wall, but you have less of a saving mechanism because of these drugs. You're going to hear more about this. Do you have any questions? With the red yeast rise and the cocutan and the fish oil, does that cause any side effect? Did yeah, no, red. Yeah, that's a good yeah, question, yeah. sir. Red, red yeast rice is how stats were developed. I don't know if many people know that. That was the origins of statin drugs, red rice yeast. Now, those are that's a safer mechanism, but that still is shutting down the enzyme, okay. HMG. But when you ask about fish oil or EPAs, that's favorable to some degree because those have higher amounts of linoleic, linolenic, and 
things like that which are beneficial. The most important thing to understand is diet controls triglycerides. So healthy eating lowers the blood fats. Now people have said, well I go on a diet and my HDLs and LDLs change. Well of course they do because the diet changes the mechanism in which the liver is saying I need more of these. Of course it's going to change it. But it's not going to change cholesterol folks. You can't lower or increase cholesterol with diet. You can't do it. Cholesterol is produced in your own body. You have predispositions where people produce higher amounts of cholesterol, so on and so forth. And cholesterol is a metabolic fuel as well. So that, that statement alone is a shock to a lot of people. You can't control cholesterol with that. No, you can't. This has been proven time and time again. Go to cholesterol skeptics. You want to have some fun? Go to cholesterol skeptics, and you'll see some of the major universities, John Hopkins, UCLA, repeating what I'm telling you. And still you have the same scenario where doctors follow the same path. So how do you control it? By meals, basically, or by diet. In America, the largest problem in America, one of the primary problems is we have a higher consumption of fats and oils that aren't metabolized correctly. As this gentleman suggested, EPA is a different type of oil than something like a saturated or a trans fat. Does that make sense? When you have a trans fat or saturation, there's other things that are invited into the system that are damaging. Hydrogen is an example. Everyone, you know, Crisco is hydrogenated oil. It's vegetable oil that's hydrogenated, so you have hydrogen that's pumped into it to make it solid at room temperature. So to answer your question, to control triglycerides means to control your eating pattern. So basically, all these things, folks, you've seen, paleo diet, eating for your blood type, yep. just throw it out the window, folks. It's just another way of trying to make money. And I'm not saying that that's their directive. They really think they're doing something correct. But when it comes down to it, folks, just a simple <coughs> vegetables, good proteins, some fruits, it's getting back to the basics, whole grains. People say you should be vegetarian. You have four canine teeth. Why do we have four canine teeth? <laughs> you think about that? Look at the simple dentition. We have molars. People should eat just paleo. Why do we have molars? For grains, not just for meat. The blood type book, if any of you have invited yourself into reading this, suggests that you should eat towards your blood type. Now, blood types are oligosaccharides. Oligosaccharides are one of the four sugars. You have polysaccharides, monosaccharides, disaccharides. Oligosaccharides are basically a mechanism that protects the cell, the blood cell. As many of you heard type O, so on and so forth. But according to this book, you should eat one particular food for this, or if you don't, it's going to cause agglutination, so on and so forth. But folks, when you break food down correctly, getting back to the stomach here, wherever it went, getting back to the <laughs> stomach, if we're breaking food down, we end up with carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. How could your body respond negatively to that? We couldn't live. The blood type book oversees that, oversteps the stomach and says, we're going to take a Petri dish take your blood, put it in a petri dish, and we're going to put this substance in, and if the, if the negative reaction of agglutination occurs, then you shouldn't eat it. Of course you're going to see responses like that if you bypass the digestive system. Does that make sense? We have to look at the digestive system, how important it is, and what it does for us. It's the beginning of health right here. And stress, unfortunately, is compromising that. So, yeah. Kevin. I was going to ask some practical ways we keep our stomach at 7.4, 7.38, and would it be safe to say, that's one part of my question, that the reason why all this suggestion, oh, you need to hydrate more, you need to do this, you need to do that, is basically just that we don't eat enough vegetables with good water content, or um, we don't eat enough good fats, we're eating processed, this is the American diet, it's just a poor diet, and that we just need to be 
go back to the real simple. Yeah, that's, you know? that's a very good premise. Thank so, you for bringing And that's how question. we would keep our stomach at that uh, point. And less too? stress if we can emotionally void ourselves from as much stress. I know that's difficult if we're selling an art gallery and we, you know, our business or we're doing this or it becomes stress and that consequently affects our system. It affects our bodies and consequently affects the stomach. Unfortunately or fortunately, we're in a stressful environment. <coughs> Obviously this can be you stressful, good stress as well, but it's distressful for a lot of conditions. Well, so, I like, you know, digestive enzymes. Does that help with the stress that you might, because I've always kind of had a stomach issue where yeah. if I put something in that's not good, like uh, processed food, I don't feel good. Uh, so it's kind very, of my barometer. For yeah, that's, that's very good. I'm glad you brought that up, which brings us to enzymes, <laughs> which I appreciate that. How many people have heard of taking enzymes? Do you think it works? Enzymes are produced within our own cell, the cytoplasm, or cytosol, actually. If the enzyme is produced in the cytosol, how can we take an enzyme from a different source and expect it to do that same thing in our system? If our body produces an enzyme, which is a protein, our bodies have to rely on producing that protein right here. So when people take enzymes, what they're actually getting is nitrogen because it breaks the protein down and liberates nitrogen. When people say, I'm taking a digestive enzyme, it feels good. What they're doing literally is saturating high amounts of nitrogen. They're not getting an enzyme that's active. You cannot refer an enzyme from one living organism to another. It's produced within the cell. An enzyme, basically all an enzyme is, is a catalyst. Basically what it does is it requires a substrate, known as a vitamin or a transitional element, and all an enzyme does is it, it makes the reaction occur much more efficiently. With these enzymes being underactive, it can create a lot of problems. But when you take an enzyme in, what you're doing, which is okay, you're just getting nitrogen. I just want people to understand that you're not getting something that's activated as an enzyme, like you take papian or something like that. It's not turning you know, papian or proteolytic enzyme, it's actually producing nitrogen and other compounds depending on what that particular nitrogen is, or that particular protein is. But that's a very good question. Good diet, vegetable, and what I mean by good is practical. As I, as I mentioned before, look at our dentition. Canine, molars, incisors, vegetables, protein. So, more and more we're hearing about GMOs being in all of our ordinary grains and soybeans in our nation. So what do we do about that? Okay, that's a good question. Everyone knows what GMOs are, right? Genetically modified, so on and so forth. Genetically modified conditions and crops has occurred for thousands of years. But we're seeing a more advanced stage. I mean, Indians, the Native Americans, genetically modified corn, the corn used to only be this big, you know. It's, so we've seen that throughout stages of the centuries. But with modern GMOs, we're seeing a shift beyond that process. So to answer your question, this leads us to wheat, and I'll get to that. Everyone hear about wheat? Yeah. What do you guys think of wheat? Okay, whole wheat is a grain that's been cultivated 60,000 years or more by humans. Whole wheat has components such as IP6, which is a nostal hexaphosphate, which is protected for the intestinal tract. It has B vitamins. It's whole wheat. We're on this fad that we should stop whole wheat. Let me explain this. The first thing I ask is, People that have a problem with whole wheat, wheat is not the only genetically modified food we're eating. Why don't we have problems with other foods? Why is it just wheat? It's a fad, folks. They're not finding the cause. Why people have problems with wheat, and I'll explain this. Am I boring you yet? That's good. <laughs> Go ahead, you can tell me, I can take it. <laughs> Criticism is the best thing. 
So, whole wheat. So basically, whole wheat has something called what in it that everyone has a response to. Can we remember what it is? Okay. Gluten essentially is called gliadin. In gliadin, or gluten, there's something called proline. Proline is an amino acid. When we take this in, the gluten or the gliadins, what happens is, if the stomach, you went through this, folks, what's slow active in the stomach? Parietal cells, right? Under stress? When that stomach is compromised, what happens is we can no longer remember what does hydrochloric acid do? Helps break proteins down, right? If we're not able to break proteins down, we're not able to extract the proline. There's a second mechanism. There's an enzyme in the intestinal tract, a sulfate enzyme. It's a reductase enzyme. It basically helps to extract proline the finished product. Once the stomach does what it does, then the rest is left to this enzyme to break it down. This enzyme, okay, this enzyme requires one, remember we talked about, what does an enzyme require, folks? It requires a substrate, right? It requires something to get it, it's, to build its catalyst, okay, to get it active. Basically, this enzyme that extracts proline requires molybdenum. Does anyone remember molybdenum periodic table? Oh. Molybdenum was once the third richest element in the Earth's crust. Farming techniques have depleted molybdenum. Okay. Take supplemental molybdenum. It's inexpensive. It's safe. Molybdenum helps this enzyme extract proline out of glass. Guess what? Allergy's gone. How many of my patients have put on this process of betaine and molybdenum? They're back to eating, maybe a little beyond what they should, but they're back to eating baked goods and they don't have a problem anymore. Celiac, sprue, IBS, Crohn's are related to the fact that this enzyme is underactive because molybdenum is depleted in the Earth's crust. It's molybdenum, folks. That's all it is, and the farming techniques have robbed molybdenum from our soils. Yes? So, this is kind of an off, I guess, question, but why do you have to have a gallbladder if they say you don't need it? Because... I mean, like, why do they have what? Like, why do you have a gallbladder if doctors say you really don't need it? Because I've had issues lately where they say that your gallbladder just doesn't digest properly, so they want to take it out. Oh, yeah. That's another good, very good question. Everyone knows what the gallbladder is, right? Don't know what that. Yeah. Okay. To answer your question, the gallbladder has bile, and bile is primarily made of cholesterol and broken down bile, which is broken down red blood cells. The gallbladder's primary purpose is to break down fat molecules into what are referred to as chylomicrons, which are really small fat molecules. If our system, the pancreas, also releases something called lipase, which is an enzyme that helps break fats down. If the pancreas is compromised in the lipase level, the gallbladder has to handle higher amounts of breaking that down regarding the bile and so on and so forth. The reason doctors feel that the gallbladder is not doing what it should or becomes static, so to speak, in its effectiveness, basically what that means is there's a conjunction for the pancreas not releasing adequate amounts of lipase. And that's all very simple components. People don't realize the pancreas is also responsible. Many people don't. The pancreas is responsible for a lot of digestive enzymes. But the gallbladder. Uh, this is, you know, they use laparoscopy now because it's so easy. They just take it out like a corkscrew. Basically, what it is, gallstones, as an example, gallstones are due to the fact that our diet does not have enough constituents to keep saponification or keep that bile broken down. 
the quickest and easiest way of taking care of a gallbladder situation, if it's advanced, is simply pectin. Fractionated pectin is taken from apples and citrus. And watch how fast that works. Pretty quick, in a week. It'll start to break down those stones. So instead of getting, because once your gallbladder is removed, there's a compromise. Now the pancreas is responsible for breaking down through lipase, of breaking down those fats. You've heard that when people have their gallbladder removed, I've got to be careful of the fats that I eat and everything else. Mm -hmm. That in part is because they're removing things rather than understanding the general premise of why these problems occur. And all it is is the lack of pectin in the diet. Does that answer the question or help? Mm -hmm. And if it becomes advanced, just take fractionated pectin. Yes? We're seeing a large increase. I just brought this to somebody's attention in our county. Uh, women that are pregnant having severe gallbladder problems, after they deliver, they're ending up with gallbladder surgery around uh -huh. here. And they're being told there's something about the pregnancy hormone that's causing more problems with your gallbladder. Or prolactin or That's exactly what I was told. Prolactin or luteinizing hormone? That has to do with the pituitary, if you're being told that, but generally it's not the case. What, what it is, they're suggesting prolactin, perhaps, or something. The prolactin is responsible, folks, as you know, ladies, mothers, for contraction. So it gets things to go in there for lactation. The hormones, are we going to, yes, sir, go ahead. So the hormones, we can address that a little bit, but that's a good question. Taking care of the gallbladder in advanced stage pectin will remedy that. But this brings us to another good question when we talk about hormones. And how much pectin is? Generally about three grams a day divided of pure pectin. Hormones, how many times are we hearing that women are so endometriosis, uterine fibroids, they're all dependent on that wonderful hormone, folks, Go ahead and tell me which one it is. Estrogen. Very good. Estrogen, or estrace. Estrogen, consequently, is affected by environmental things as well. There's this big fad, that's the big story today, fad, that soy is bad. Soy is the best thing you can do. What they've done is they've said, well, Every time someone takes soy, what happens is we see spikes in estrace and estrogen. Have you heard that? Yeah. Folks, there are receptor sites on a cell. And those receptor sites are specific. In this condition, in this situation, we have receptor sites for estrace or estrogen. Estrogen in excess, because of environmental contaminants, which is a different subject. Estrogen reception site, right here. If those sites are left vacant, estrogen will attach. Guess what soy does? There, it's soy is a gynostene. And the gynostene attaches and fills these receptor sites. So consequently, what happens to the estrogen? It ends up in the bloodstream. Researchers are saying, guess what? Taking soy raises estrogen. Soy blocks estrogen receptors, which consequently shows in the bloodstream that estrogen's gone up, which is favorable. You don't want estrogen to attach to those cells. Consequently, guess what you're going to get? Endometriosis, uterine fibroids. Yes? I think it's going back to the, this is a plant-based uh, phytoestrogen as opposed to these um, what estrogen mimicants are the xenoestrogens from plastics, herbicides, oh. of, you know, which are thousands and thousands of times stronger than a plant of estrogen. Yeah, exactly. Or that influences estrogen. Good, good point, Ian. So blocking the receptor sites is critical. Soy is beneficial, folks. When I was traveling in Asia, we would see women that were 90 years old. Their diet primarily was soy, and I'm going, okay. Common sense. Why are these women not suffering from breast cancer, uterine fibroids, and the U.S. is telling you, and they're soy, they're soy-based diets? Could you please explain to me where common sense has gone, folks. Can I just add on to that? Um, 
the, a lot of the, uh, come back to the GMOs too, a lot of the products now, they're, they're, they've been genetically modified, like ready roundup soy, to be able to um, have all the pest that they can handle the pesticides, everything else dies, but it's, they're, they're full of all these xenoestrogens and that the, are the, on the plants. Uh, so I think the, the, the soy is great, but the, uh, not necessarily the GMO soy. Correct. You want to get organic soy, so to speak. You want to get organic or fresh soy, basically. In fresh meaning it's okay. GMO is a problem, that is correct. But being correctly pro brought out, even more dangerous to that are polyvinyl hydrocarbons that influence the hormones in women. And it negatively influences it. The reason why is because it stimulates the pituitary gland to secrete what, beyond what it needs to, and obviously the ovaries and things, the uterus, where we see the propagation of these hormones. As an example, prolactin from the pituitary gland, so on and so forth. So that's a good question. So we have to look at environmental, which brings us back to GSHP. Remember, this all ties together, folks. See how this all comes together? It, we're dealing with a changing exogenous environment. What we want to do is we want to make sure we adapt to this environment but correctly so it doesn't so it doesn't implicate problems for us physically. So when we talk about hormones and estrogen and the problems we're seeing with uterine fibroids, and we're seeing problems, so many other problems besides birth control folks, birth control pills, okay. Uh, to give you an idea, I designed a birth control for males. Serious. Not one male would take it. No, I'm serious. Ser I'm it was not, it was a situation that cut down motility in the sperm. And once you stop taking it, the motility would return. Not one male would take it. My wife can take birth control. Let her do it. Let my girlfriend take birth control. So, I just wanted to touch on that, that it, it also has to do with, you know, where are, come on, share and participate folks in the process, if that makes sense. I don't want to get on a... Self-box is fine. What's that? Getting on the self-box is fine. Yeah, is that okay? I mean, I really... It, so, birth control is really... I have a lot of questions with birth control folks. With women, I do because of what we're seeing in the advanced stages of using birth control. Endometriosis one is an example. So, any questions? I hope this is as fun as the new Sherlock movie. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. I'm to say, um, the Lithium Watchers said it was because it's so something that's um, going through celiacs, are you saying that that could potentially be killed through Sort of dosage of that. Definitively. So not just probable. So I mean, is it's, that more of a supplement? Is that uh, it's a supplement. Molybdenum is a supplement. It's inexpensive, folks. It's like six, eight dollars for a kilo supply. In conjunction with daytime that we talked about. Right here. Celiac sprue. And, and remember, folks, when people avoid wheat, they're avoiding IP6 that has been associated with protecting colon from cancer. Uh, what was your dosage on that? On molybdenum? Generally, you can get molybdenum. It depends on what milligrams. Different manufacturers might make it in 20 milligrams. You can get it from 5 to about 30 milligrams. And generally, you want to see about maybe 50 milligrams. And by the way, your MSG problems will go away too, folks. MSG is a natural product. Monosodium glutamate, glutamate is a root. The reason problem, people have problems with it is because of low molybdenum. So would you keep taking that, or would you just take it now? You'd probably keep taking it because everyone has predispositions. <laughs> One bridge is constructed to handle 10 tons of weight. Another bridge is constructed to handle 15 tons of weight. There, that's the predisposition, like a genetic marker. We hear about genetic markers. You're fair skin, someone's dark skin, you can handle more sun than the other person. So what it means is some people rely on taking that supplementally more than someone else, as an example but also test the parietal cells, the stomach. Yes? Yeah, you were talking about the proteins. You know, my um, ferritin level's been going way up you know, every year when I go through my test. Uh, and um, so 
I was just wondering uh, if, I don't know if that's something I should, what to be doing about that naturally. I'm sorry, what levels are going in? The ferritin, it's the protein. Oh, ferritin and iron. That ferritin, yeah. the iron, and it raises. Right, I'll explain that to you. Fair, folks, what this young lady is talking about is iron. There's three forms of iron in our system. There's ferritin, which is iron and protein combined, which is cursed into the intestinal tract. Then there's something called free serum iron. There's the last thing is called iron binding capacity. And what it means basically is when the ferritin levels go up, yours is going up, you said. Basically what that means is the binding capacity is dropped. Even though this the mechanism on the blood test might indicate it. Yeah, just like you said, it's because it's really not, it's releasing it so it shows higher when mm -hmm. it So basically what I would like you to try is simple methylcobalamin. How could you spell that? Sure. <laughs> 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 Can you say that? Okay. Methylcobalamin or B12. <coughs> oh, B12. Yeah, methyl. Okay, but there's two forms of it. Oh. <laughs> there's sinocobalamin and methylcobalamin. You want to go with the methyl, our methyl group right here. Just, just look at the look at the B12 with methyl. And just remember that. And what you do is you take 5,000 micrograms a day, and you should see a shift in that. Okay. Okay? Now, by the way, folks, people that, yes? You can finish your thought. People that have anemia, okay. where's our stomach? You know, I should keep this. Here we go. You're going to have to keep the stomach. That's a nice ring for your phone or something. Okay. Basically, the intrinsic factor is something that the stomach is prepared for to absorb iron. Okay? A B12. When that intrinsic factor drops, it's because you have hypochloridria, which is right here. Simply by testing and taking bay time, that condition of low iron or low ferritin, in your case it's high, low serum iron, will be corrected because you're increasing the intrinsic factor. Just want to suggest that. You had a, I'm sorry, go ahead. I had a couple of questions. You talked about when we were talking about common sense foods that you qualified when you, when you came from vegetables. You also said then good protein. So I'm curious as to what what falls within the parameter for you for good protein. And then also when you're talking about different folks have mentioned that they had tests or blood tests. Who controls the parameters of what falls within the levels of you know, whether or not you're too high in your HDL or too low, um, or, or or if there, if your ferritin is too high or too low, or whatever. Good question. Who, who, who controls that? So the first answer, the first question, that's a good question. The good proteins would be the ones generally lower in trans fats. Salmon, turkey, fowl, legumes, beans. The food's higher in trans fat, which doesn't mean you can't have them. That consequently produces more triglycerides faster, which creates blood flowing, which creates the problems in the arterial wall. So everything's site specific in terms of the person that's consuming it, exactly. depending on what your digestive, how healthy you are, could determine exactly. what ends up being good for you or not. Exactly. That's a very good question. Number two, who determines the values, the lab values? Or the parameters or the... That changes, that's a good question, because that changes every six months. Yeah. Uh, it's ridiculous. Is it, how many people have heard about low thyroid? Everyone's got low thyroid. You know, the TSH is high, it's low, and those parameters change. My Merck manual, I have to get a new one every year because it changes all the time. And you know what, it's changing to their, their interpretation. It's not changing. I've had people who are TSH folks. TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone. They say, seriously, I'm not joking, they say that normal, Who's the thing? in a normal range, is now 0 0.20. Yeah. But who, take it a little bit further, who's the they? I mean, is it the Different pharmaceutical labs. company? Is it government? Yeah. Is it, um, it's, it's not government, it's all dictated by labs. And that's what's hard. Different labs will have different Who owns the labs? 
You know, that's a good question. I mean, I just to me, it's like follow the money trail. Okay. I think you're right, but that's a very good question. By more research, I encourage people to do more research, and I'll do that as well because I'm not exactly sure of the lab's ownership and so on and so forth. But that's a very good question. Very good point. You can see that it's controlled. You can see this young lady is getting to the point of hey, manipulation. The Merck Manual is the medical bible that is produced by who? Merck. <laughs> One of the largest pharmaceuticals in the, they're literally making up pathologies. So they, listen to this, they design a drug and they say, okay, let's make a pathology for this. Ritalin, classic example for attention deficit disorder. Can you believe, and they, they literally say, okay, now we're gonna, that's why we have new pathologies coming up all the time, so that's a very good question in point to what you had asked about who designs this stuff. That's something to seriously consider. Very good question, though. Who does? But my point with that, the TSH level at 0.2 being normal, 20 years ago, this was considered near thyroid storm, hyperactive. I've had people that come in that are saying, Kevin, I can't sleep, I have night sweats, I'm getting thin, but my doctor says it's okay. My TSH is at 0.2, and I'm going, what? This is how bad this is getting to address your question. What roadmap are we following here? How can we trust this anymore? I put them on a goitrogen, a blocker to block, the, and sure enough, their TSH goes up and they feel better. So what does that tell us? Who is setting the roadmap, which is a very good question, on what we're following? It sure doesn't seem like it's doing much for us, does it, folks? Diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular problems, they're all increasing, they're not going down, and this is not based on a ratio or population amounts. It's based on a ratio, I'm going to correct that. It's going up, it's not going down. Is it just in this country, or is it We're seeing globally? it in Europe, it's like Australia, we're seeing it, but we're not seeing it in indigenous societies such as uh, Africa, the continent of Africa as an example. We're not seeing it that much. We're not seeing that that much in certain areas in Central America or in Northern China. It's really interesting that endogenous societies that are not touched by this Western medicine protocol seem to be healthier overall. And we're not listening to that. We're not looking at it. That's what is surprising to me. And we're creating new pathologies. The obesity rate in America is over 51% now. 51%. We don't see this in northern China. We don't see this in Nepal, areas in Nepal, Mongolia, so on and so forth. I would say it's safe to say that there is a connection. Wouldn't you? Yes. Um, what do you think of our government's food pyramid? I don't agree, obviously. I don't agree with that. And where, where, where did it come from? You know, they probably have representatives that sit there and say, well, I took half of a semester of nutrition. Or, even more interesting, doctors that have probably had no nutritional course or no biochemical course. It's really amazing to me when we get back to what we listen to authorities, so to speak, to address your question. Why do we believe the authority? Why? Can anyone address that for me? I mean, I understand believing a roofer to put the roof on your, your house because they're experienced. But in a situation that is, what, would you hire a roofer if the roof leaked every year he did it? That he put a new roof on? And yet we keep going back. There was a poll taken that asked, I, th I think, it, don't hold me to this, but I think it was a thousand doctors that were asked, you know, that weren't identified, that were asked if medicine turned social, how many would continue in their practice? 80% would leave. <clears throat> Guess what, folks? It's no longer about first do no harm. Remember the Hippocratic Oath? It's about, and that's not all of them. What it suggests is 
is the doctor, and I'm just, I'm not saying it is, but I'm asking you, do you think the doctor's attention is fully on you when you're sitting in his office for nine minutes? I hope in my practice that I give you folks more attention than that. I mean, you have to deal with my humor. But besides that, it's important for the doctor to listen, the practitioner to listen. And I think that's being lost. Because if we did listen, we'd be seeing changes in pathologists. Yes? My next question, because I've been fighting overweight for most of my life, I've also been told I have to drink a lot more water so my liver, so it helps my kidneys work properly, so my liver can help with fat metabolization. Do you think that's true now? That you, when you've heard me I'm speak? going to the bathroom once an hour the whole day, and it's not working real well. I know. There you go. Thank so you for bringing that up. So that's not correct. That is, because you would see it if it was. Okay. Let's look at observation. Let's go back to the simple aspect of observation. Have you ever woken up and looked in the mirror and said, and it's because of what you did the following day or something like that. It's, you know, it's the same thing. It's simple observation. It's simple observation. You know, I always bring up the protocol. This is getting on a tangent, but I'm just going to, I wrote, I have a cookbook that's coming out, folks. It should be next year sometime. It talks about making foods, and it teaches you the biochemistry of foods and why they do exactly what they do. And in the book, there's the beginning, you'll see it. It should be at the end of next year or something. And it's really interesting, you'll see where the proposal comes from. Is there was a man that I understand that was crucified about 2,000 years ago. And he was being crucified and stuck on a cross. If I correct me if I'm wrong, he said, forgive them for they do not know what they do. My interpretation is he was saying, forgive them for they don't love themselves. Why are you going to kill someone if you love yourself? Why are you going to become fat if you love yourself? Loving ourselves means we respect ourselves and what we are. So if we look at it and say, I don't want to be taller, shorter, I don't want to be anything else, I'm happy to be who I am, then we can treat ourselves accordingly and respect our bodies and not put on weight or respect what we're doing, respect what has been given to us. It's just being able to recognize it, recognize the parameters. We have folks, our minds are free. We can go to the moon mentally and back within a split second. Our bodies are not free. We're doing the opposite. We're giving our bodies all the freedom in the world. We're putting in any kind of food we can, and it consequently does this, and we're narrowing our minds saying, I'm told to do this. I gotta drink water. I gotta do, you know what I mean? Look at what we're doing, we're doing the opposite. Isn't that phenomenal to me? So if we look at ourselves and we're happy the way we are, we respect ourselves and we say, listen, I don't think I need to drink this soda. We respect it. And that's, it's loving ourselves. And that's why I bring that analogy up. If we love ourselves, why are we going to hurt anyone else? Or why are we going to hurt ourselves? In America, Folks, we have a pandemic in LA. Women are killing themselves at 30 years old because they're getting older. They're looking older. These actresses, because everything they have in the world is their beauty, their looks. That's where it's come to. We're the only country, listen to this, that'll actually eat a meal and throw it up. While other people are starving, we eat a meal and we intentionally throw it up. It's, we're a very interesting race, aren't we? Yes? So is the lack of an appropriate uh, pH balance, acidic balance in your stomach, the primary cause of food sensitivities as well? Uh-huh, exactly. In my opinion, the pH gradient shift, the higher it goes, basically the more sensitive we are to foods, we're not absorbing things, we can, folks, Osteoarthritis, osteopenia, you women are familiar with that. Why does it happen in women, not men? 
Why does rheumatoid arthritis happen in 95% of women and not men? Why do autoimmune diseases occur in most, mostly women, 95% of women and not men? Ever think about that? pH, when we talk about estrogen, progesterone, all of those wonderful hormones that shift, shift the pH. As they shift through menopause or perimenopause or anything like that, it alters the pH. So women are mistakenly being told to take calcium. Calcium doesn't do anything, folks. It just increases the risk for cardiovascular disease. Because calcium can't be broken down as a complex. That's why potassium, sodium, and magnesium are the most important electrolytes to keep this important. Because when you keep that important, guess what's going to happen when you keep it up? The bone is preserved. I've had many times women that have come to me in DEXA scans that have said, you know, I've been losing bone, and the DEXA scan indicates that. I take them off calcium, put them on the pH, potassium, sodium, magnesium. Within three months, the DEXA scan is showing bone oh health. Tell them to stop drinking water when they're not thirsty, and basically start giving electrolytes. And ladies, you, you don't have to live with osteopenia or osteoporitis or osteomalacia or anything like that. You don't have to. The autoimmune diseases, women occur, occurs because of this. The hormones consequently affect this. The auto, remember we covered this? What happens if the processes aren't working as they should? Foods aren't being broken down. The antibodies begin to respond in a fashion where they say, this is a negative factor. Let's begin to attack. Lupus. Mm -hmm. Rheumatoid, uh-huh. There seems to be a lot of MS in this area. Multiple sclerosis. What do you... What do I'd you be mean? happy to talk. Does everyone know what multiple sclerosis is? Also, Lou Gehrig's, the associated, it has to do with the patients on the brain. MS, <coughs> basically, multiple sclerosis, is something called a demyelinization. So you have a nerve, and the nerve basically has a myelin sheath around it, which is like a fat, okay? If I start to bore anyone, just tell me if it's gonna break. <laughs> Let's take a little break after. Okay, is everyone okay? Is everyone's bladder okay? <laughs> okay, let's take this. We need some water. <laughs> yeah, you need some water? There's a soda machine out there, isn't there? <laughs> okay, so MS basically is a perforation of the myelin sheath right here. And we'll just call it a myelin sheath. And basically, and they can be lesions or perforations. MS, folks, it's really interesting. There's a study that showed, we touched on this, polyvinyl hydrocarbons, or formaldehyde, affects the myelin sheath. It deteriorates it. Where do we, where do we find formaldehyde? Plastic bags in grocery stores, upholstery, it's all over, folks. Everything. The reason some people have it and other people don't, they're attacked by this, is because there's an inborn error. And the inborn error basically determines how glycine, the amino acid, is utilized. Are you glycine talking genetics? Simplest, yeah, glycine is the simplest amino acid. That inborn error means that people metabolize glycine quicker. And this was done in a study in the Soviet Union that they exposed I forgot how many numbers in a randomized test. They exposed, let's say 500, 500 and 500 to formaldehyde. Those that had the inborn error metabolized glycine so fast that they begin to show signs of multiple sclerosis and they took blood draws and they find how high amount of formaldehyde in the blood serum. Those that didn't have the error the formaldehyde was discharged, it was excreted, and it never affected the myelin sheath. Why some of us can handle carpet and plastic and not show signs of degeneration has to do with this inborn air. Therapeutically, we're working very effective in low advanced stages of MS by just 
basically therapeutically using glycine. Because glycine matches the metabolic response on these inborn neuro uh, situations. So people that are metabolizing glycine at a rapid level, if we keep that level substantial, it essentially addresses the formaldehyde that's accumulated. There's another way of treating that as well, and that's giving, besides glycine, something called phosphatidylcholine, which is a constituent in this, the lining of the cell, or the myelin sheath. Now remember, we should keep this up here too. GSHP, remember? Our family, if we keep that active, uh, if we keep glutathione peroxidase high in its activity, it also manages these inborn errors. So glutathione peroxidase seems to be correlated to inborn errors. Does that answer your question? So basically you'd see by therapeutic administration of glycine and fossil titocholine, you will see more than likely if it's not advanced too far, a better than in MS. And increasing GSHP, glutathione peroxidase. Bathroom medic, both. <laughs> Do you find this interesting? Yes. yes. Very good. Please, and keep asking questions. I encourage you. Okay?